and welcome to Learn Your Color Computer. So let's begin. I'd like to say a few words about the biggest problem in the computer community today, and that's the closet computers. They're the ones that end up in your closet, alone and neglected, after a few fun hours with playing some games. This usually takes place a few months after Christmas, when somebody buys a color computer for the kids to play with. Then, when the fun wears off, into the closet it goes, to sit and gather dust, never to realize its full potential. Some folks may have just had it break down on them and decided not to get it fixed, even for a blown fuse. Well, this has gone on for too long now. With the millions of computers in people's homes today, only a few thousand of them have taken the time to learn their computer and take advantage of the remarkable power available in the small white case. Some people have even used their computers to run their own businesses. But this is not enough. If everybody who owned a closet computer was to become a serious color computer user, we'd be a more powerful group than any other. And this is what the series of shows is all about. So let's begin. Hi, welcome to the 12th installment of Learn Your Color Computer. In this installment, I'm going to teach you about the dim command and how it works to create dimensioned arrays of singular and multi-dimensioned proportions. This will be followed with the existence and use of the slash and asterisk characters in mathematical functions, plus a special treat for those of you who enjoy graphics. I'll show you how we've been creating the graphic screens that you've been seeing on this show. The dim command is used to create a dimensioned array. An array can be anywhere from one to three dimensions. To use the command, you must have at least one dimension. To set this command in a program, you must have the command name. This is followed by the variable name, which can be numeric or string. This is followed by either one, two, or three pieces of peak data, all separated by commas, and all of it enclosed in parentheses. The peak data is how high you want your dimension to go. The minimum depth is zero. You can make the top of the array go as far as free memory permits. There is exception for reasons to make a dim command present in your program. If for some reason the top of your dimension goes no higher than 11, you don't need to have a dim command to dimension it. To see how the dim command works, type in this program. First, clear out memory with new. Now we'll start with line number 10, where we dim a string 15. Now we'll go to line number 20, where we print enter 16 lines of text. Now we go to line 30. We do 4 x equal 0 to 15. Now we go to line 40 where we print semicolon. Now we go to 50, where we input, quote, greater than, space, quote, semicolon, a string, x. Now we go to line 60, 
where we'll say next x. Now we do line 70 where we print and then again we'll print quote your text is quote now we'll line 80 we'll say for x equal 0 to 15 then in line 90 we'll print a string x then we'll go to line 100 where we do a next x then line 110 we'll terminate our program with that old familiar end command now run the program and type 16 lines of text as instructed. For instance, first line will say, this is line number one. Then we'll say, this is another line and so forth and so forth then we'll do line number four line five line six line seven line number eight line nine line ten line eleven line twelve line thirteen line 14 our last line the dim command in line 10 tells the program that the dimension is 16 elements high and to assign the data to a string lines 30 through 60 get the data from your keyboard. Notice how data is assigned directly to a dimension of a string in line 50. Lines 80 through 100 show you the data you typed in as proof positive that the text did in fact fit in the dimension of one variable. And of course at line 110 the program was over. Let's try that one again. We'll do it quick. Run. And we'll say 0, 1, wait. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And notice it does start with the string your text is. And it gives us all our numbers that we entered. In effect, we've, what we've actually done is caused a variable to hold 16 pieces of data instead of the usual one. Plus, we're using a number in parentheses following the variable, which can be a variable itself to let the variable know which piece of data to use. The next logical step up is multi-dimensional arrays. Let's start with double dimension to keep it simple. This one has the second piece of data in the dim command. To see how this works, type this program in. 
First, we'll clear out memory with new. And we'll start with line number 10, where we dim V as 3, comma, 2. Now, we'll set up some information in line 20 with data, 143, comma, 678, comma, 215, comma, 514, comma, 125, comma, 430. Then, in line 30, we'll set up a little four next loop with 4D equals 1, 2, 3. Let's set up our first dimension. And then we'll go to line 40, where we do a four next loop of 4C equals 1 to 2 to set up our second dimension. Now in line 50, we'll get our information with read V D comma C. That'll actually put the information in. Now in line 60, close up our loops. Next, C, followed by line 70, where we do next, D. Now, run the program. Line number 10 reserved space for a variable called V, which is 3 high and 2 wide. Let's take a look at it. Print 0, comma, 0. That is V, 0, comma, 0. And we do actually have a val value equal to 0, because notice our four next loop, which tells us the dimension, started at 1. OK, so we'll start with 1. And we print V, 1, comma, 1. And it comes up with 143, as it should. Notice that is part of our data, the first part. Then we'll print V 1, comma, 2. 768, which was the second part in that piece. Lines 20 through 70 assign the data to the array in such an order so that the computer sees the data something like this. You might say that you could look upon a two-dimensional array as a row and a column assigned to a variable. This means that row 1, column 1, is equal to 143 and row 3, column 2, is equal to 430. So far, we have plenty of potential for placing pieces of data in rows and columns of an array we've assigned to a variable. Now let's add a third and final dimension. We'll call it the array depth. Type in this program, and we'll see how depth comes into the picture. First, clear out memory with new. Then we'll start with line 10, where we dim V as 3, comma, 3, comma, 2, which would be our height of 3, width of 3, and depth of 2. Now we go to line 20, where we set up our information with data. 143, comma, 678, comma, 215, comma, 514, comma, 125, comma, 430. Then we go to line 30, 
where we say data, and our information is 525, comma, 54, comma, 318, comma, 157, comma, 254, comma, 200. Now we go to line 40, where we have data, 400, comma, 119, comma, 124, comma, 300, comma, 75, comma, 419. Then we'll go right to line 50, where we'll set up our information in a for next loop. For g equals 1 to 3. Then our next loop starts at line 60, where we do 4d equals 1, 2, 3. Then line 70, we'll do our final for next loop, starting with 4c equals 1 to 2. Now on line 80, we'll actually get our information from the data with read v g comma d comma c. Then we'll go to line 90, where we close up our c loop with next c. Then line 100, we close up our d loop with next D. Then line 110, we close up our G loop with next G. Now run the program. Line number 10 reserved enough space in memory for three dimensions of the V variable. Then lines 20 through 110 assigned all the data to each of the three dimensions of our variable. The computer is now seeing the data in a sort of three-dimensional setup arranged like this. To make things a little simpler yet, let's look at this three-dimensional array as a cube. Now, knowing what the dimension looks like, we could easily find any one of the squares in the dimension. Say we wanted to find a dimension in the cube which was at 2, comma 1, comma 1. Starting at the upper left corner, we count two squares to the right. Then from there, we count down one square. Then backwards one square. And there we are at 2, comma 1, comma 1. We can also do the same thing with 3, comma 2, comma 1, like so. And also with 3, comma 3, comma 2. Next, let's go over those two extra math operators that we missed earlier, which are the symbols for division and multiplication. They are the slash character and the asterisk character. Sure, we've used them, but we haven't gone into any detail as to how, how they do their jobs. The division, as you may have guessed, is handled by the slash character and can be used in any division function. Try these two functions to demonstrate how the slash is used. We'll print 15 slash meaning divided by 3. And sure enough we come up with a value of 5. 
Okay, so now we'll try print 40 divided by 10, which should come up 4, and it does. As you can see, this makes division a simple task, as so it should. But life is not all division. There is also, as you may have noticed, many situations in which you must be able to do multiplication. That's where the asterisk operator comes in handy. That's what we use to multiply with. To make this easier to understand, type in this short program. Clear out memory with new first, and then we'll start with law number 10, where we say 4x equal 1 to 2. Better yet, we'll make it to 12. Then we'll go to line 20, where we say r equals x asterisk, meaning multiplied by 10. Then we go to line 30, where we print quote, 10 times semicolon, x semicolon, quote, space, equals, space, quote, semicolon, r. Then line 40, close up our loop with next x. What this program does is take all your multiples of 10 from 1 to 12 and prints them on your screen. Notice the variable r in line 20. That's what is equal to the value of x times 10. Now, run the program. And if there were no errors in your copy of the program, you should get the same result that I have here. We also can use this same method with division. Change line 20 and 30 like this. Edit 20. C slash enter. And edit 30. And we'll do 5D, shift up arrow, insert with I, divided. Now run the program again. And this time, instead of multiplying by 10, this time, it divides by 10 and gives us the answers to all divisions from 0 to 12. Remember, however, that you cannot divide anything by 0 except for 0 itself. Observe what happens in such an attempt. Print 1 divided by 0. Now that's a really strange name for an error. This error is called divide by zero error. And it's always indicated by a question mark followed by a slash and a zero. This error will pop up any time you try to divide anything by zero except for zero. A number in the form of a variable or in the form of a regular number can be used with either the slash or the asterisk as many times as you can fit it into a program line. I think you're about ready for another one of our tricks of the trade. So, I'll show you how we've been doing some of the high resolution pictures that you've been seeing on the show these past few weeks. First thing I'll need is a, is a bit of a short program to load the pictures in with. So, type this one in. 
first, clear out memory with new. Then we'll go right to line 10, where we line input, quote, file name, colon, quote, semicolon, f string. That'll take the name of the file. And line 20, we'll say p mode 4, comma, 1, colon, screen, 1, comma, 1, colon, pc, ls. Don't worry about those three. Now, next we go to line 30, where we say load m, f string. Now, in line 40, we say k string equals in key string, colon, if k string equal nulled string, then go to 40. Now in line 50, we say go to 10. Now run the program and enter a file name, such as cube 211 bin, which is one we used earlier today. That's about all the time we have left for this show. Next time, we'll go over how to load, run, and save programs you've made yourself, and also how to load and run store-bought programs as well. See you then.